viewers in today's class we shall be discussing about legal system in ancient india ancient indian law was all encompassing covering numerous aspects of social and religious life that are outside the jurisdiction of the modern codes law is seen as a means of controlling societal functions legal literature of ancient times throw light how our ancestors interpreted complex social problems and prescribed rules for regulating human behavior our knowledge about the evolution of hindu law is dedicated to this particular source we do not know much about the legal system of the rigvedic period it's quite apparent that the idea of divine cosmic order already existed it was known as rita and it was rita which regulated the universal process it manifested itself as a moral law it was perhaps the forerunner of the later concept of dharma etymologically dharma means what holds things together in ashokan inscriptions and some other buddhist sources it seems to have the broad general meaning of righteousness according to manu dharma is the way which has been followed and lived with perfect purity of heart by the wise and the learned who have neither likes nor dislikes who wish well for all creatures who are knowers of veda and whose conduct conforms to the standards of dharma in its broadest sense dharma encompasses both ritualistic ethics and ethical values while the ritualistic ethics leads to customary morality and ethical values to reflective morality therefore the term dharma encompasses both the customs of the caste as well as the qualities of a soul in its widest sense in legal literature it is defined as a divinely ordained norm of good conduct varying in accordance with the caste and class the importance of dharma lies in the fact that it promoted happiness and individual security besides it also endeavors to promote the stability of the social order each man's dharma has a unique role to play in the larger more complex social structure thus a man demonstrates a sense of responsibility towards others in the society by following his own dharma if all members of the society try to formulate their own rules of dharma it would result in chaotic state of affairs dharma formed the basis of individual's life and collective security so we need to understand that without law the state of nature would be equivalent to anarchy and it was this fear which further led to the elevation of dharma to a divine status this in turn placed it on higher pedestal than the government and the king undoubtedly dharma is said to have originated from vedas however originally it is the dharm shastras which are generally looked into for actual interpretation of religious duties dharm shastras are regarded as the only authentic guides to law custom and duty they are considered to be of divine origin dharm shastras is a general name given to different categories of early legal writings which included number 1 dharma sutras number 2 smritis number 3 tika number 4 nibandh dharm sutras are ascribed roughly to 500 to 200 bc these are our earliest sources of hindu law of them the most important being attributed to gautam bodhayana vishisht and apastham the dharm sutras were generally written in prose although some of them also contained verses so these earliest law books were the first to give structured description of the warner system and they specified the duties of the 
four varnas clearly. They enjoined the king to uphold the varna based social order and to see that the members of every varna carry out their duties. The inception of the civil and the criminal laws have to be ascribed to this particular period. Under the civil law, they have included such topics as taxes, inheritance, position of women, and under criminal law, assaults, adultery, thefts, etc. have been included. The authors of Dharam Sutras did not think alike. There are distinguishable dissimilarities amongst them both in respect of ideas of crime and punishment. The differences are due partly to differences in their age and locality of origin and partly also to the various schools in which these texts were studied. So the study of Dharma Sutras is significant for gaining knowledge about the history of marriage, family, property, varna system and untouchability. The Dharam Sutras codify laws relating to guild of merchants and artisans. The internal organization of these guilds was carried on accordance to their customs. The earliest law books also mention the use of coins in trade and in the context of judicial fines. So by the beginning of Christian era, the place of Dharma Sutras was taken over by Smritis. The period of composition of the Smritis can be placed between 200 BC to 900 AD. However, both Smritis were compiled by the end of 6th century AD. The Dharam Sutras were written in prose while the Smritis were written in verse. So this is the major difference. Dharam Sutras, they were written in prose while the Smritis were written in verse. And the subjects treated in Dharma Sutras are dealt in detail in the Smritis which also include new topics not existing in the earliest law books. There are numerous Dharam Shastras, the earliest of which is that of Manu, probably composed in its final form in the 2nd or 3rd century AD. Other important Dharam Shastras are that of Yajnavalka, Vishnu and Narad which dated from the Gupta period and the Middle Ages. The Smritikaras like Manu, Brahaspati, Yajnavalkya, Narad, Katyayana have played significant role in formulating the rules for governing social and religious life of the people which were accepted as authoritative in the judicial administration and prescription of duty. Talking about Manu, Manu is largely concerned with human conduct. The works of his successors approach more and more closely to purely legal textbooks. The law book of Manu, which is also known as Manu Smriti, is in fact the oldest and the most predominant amongst all the Dharam Shastras. It provides us guidelines for righteous living and social conduct. The code of Manu is so significant that it continued to impress the conduct and nature of Indian society even after his age. It addresses dharma as a supreme power in the state which played a vital role in guiding society, kings and individuals in their entirety. It mentions the duties of the individuals on the basis of their varna that is class and ashram that is stages of life. It also delineates the procedures of administering justice and prescribing punishments for different offenses. The rules related to marriage, inheritance and succession are also discussed at length. It also emphasized upon ethical conduct and fair conduct in business and trade transactions. Manusmriti has always been under controversy due to certain discriminatory remarks regarding gender and caste. In contemporary scenario, the effect of Manusmriti has been considerably reduced. Our modern legal system upholds the principle of justice and equality for all. However, Manusmriti is still considered significant 
by the historians and scholars for its historical and cultural significance. It assists in comprehending ancient legal thoughts in Hinduism. Brahaspati, Yajnavalka, Narad, Katayana, they also represent the last stage of legal development. Indeed, they are the last of the original lawgivers of ancient India. Now coming over to the Brahaspati Smriti, right? The Brahaspati Smriti focuses upon the principles of dharma. It also laid stress upon the Varna system, emphasizing the role of each Varna in outlining the role and responsibilities of different social classes. It also provides us with the framework for dealing with legal matters, specifying the type of offenses, appropriate punishments and principles of fairness in dispensing justice. It also offers guidance on marriage, inheritance of property and functioning of households, thereby contributing to social stability. It also guides us on rules and regulations related to economic activities, trade and commerce. As far as penal law is concerned, Brahaspati is quite forthright in that particular context. According to him, if the abused returns the abuse, one who is stuck returns the blow and one who is attacked kills the assailant, he commits no offence. One who injures had to meet the expenses of curing the wounds. The aggrieved party is provided compensation for offences of this type. If more than one person is involved in beating a man to death, the one who stuck the fatal blow received prescribed punishment while others receive half of it. So in prescribing punishment for theft or violence, Brahaspati is concerned more with the gravity of the offence than with the caste of the offender. Coming over to the next smriti that is Yajnavalga smriti. Now this particular smriti is named after one of the greatest sages in India, Yajnavalga. Modern scholars are of the view that although Yajnavalga is one of the most systematic and comprehensive of the law books and its influence is second only to that of Manusmriti, it makes only a small original theoretical contribution. Yajnavalkya was the first to mention about the three popular courts namely Kul, Shreni and Puga arranged in the ascending order of importance. Yajnavalkya is one with Braspati relating to the law of partition and inheritance. If the partition took place during the lifetime of a father, the eldest son was entitled to the best share or else it may be divided equally amongst all the sons. If the partition took place after the death of the father, his assets and liabilities were shared equally by the sons. The mother was entitled to an equal share while the sisters got a fourth part of the son's share. Got it? Yajnavalka also championed widow's right to inheritance and this recognized the widow as a heir. Narada, coming over to Narada Smriti, right? Narada provides the first legal commentary that is not encumbered with precepts of religion and morality. He based judicial procedure on the foundations of dharma, rational law and royal decree. He gave an in-depth description of the courts of justice and makes the king's representative as a permanent judicial functionary. He is remembered for his significant contribution to the law of inheritance and partition. When the property is divided by the father himself, he could keep two shares and distribute the rest amongst his sons according to his own inclinations. If partitioned after his death, it was to be shared equally by his sons after clearing his debts. A legitimate son proved to be hostile to his father or is expelled from caste or guilty of a minor offence was not entitled to inheritance. 
the daughters were entitled to inherit in the absence of sons, while a widow was given the right to maintenance. Narada also allowed capable younger brother to manage the family. This remarkable rule cuts at the root of the strict law of primogeniture. Coming over to next smriti that is Katyayana. Katyayana along with Narad and Brahaspati represent the last stage of legal development. His code is rational and refreshing. He gave a detailed account of the constitution and court procedure. He accorded permission to the widows to succeed immediately to her deceased husband's property. In the absence of sons, the property's father's property was shared by daughters, the father, the mother, the brother and his sons. The scope of Sridhan, everybody must be familiar with the Sridhan. The scope of Sridhan was enlarged as to include all property, whether movable or immovable, obtained by a woman, either as a maiden or at marriage or after marriage from her parents or the family or relatives of the parents or from the husband and his family except immovable property given by the husband. He upholds women's absolute right over Sridhan. This is quite appreciable, I, I must say. Katyana declares that the Sridhan of the mother goes to the sisters whose husbands are living along with the brothers and it devolves on the sons on failure of daughters. Many medieval jurists who wrote lengthy commentaries that is Tika and Digest Nibans on the Smriti literature. Out of these, the most important was Vijneshwara, who wrote at the court of the great Chalukyan emperor Vikramaditya VI, who ruled from circa 1075 to 1127. His Mitakshara, the commentary on the law book of Yajnavalga, played a very significant role in forming the civil law of modern India. Other important jurists of the Middle Ages were Himadari and Jimutvahan. Their treatises on inheritance, that is Dayabhag, a part of great compilation called Dharma Ratna, has also influenced later Indian law. We cannot say confidently that the whole Smriti literature is the work of Brahmanas. They wrote from their own viewpoint. The Arthashastra, written from a more secular angle, differs from the Smritis in many aspects. The advice of the Smritis was not regularly followed in many of the ancient kingdoms. With the passage of time, it became increasingly authoritative. The statements given in the Smritis must be checked in comparison to the Arthashastra and by passing references to law and custom in general literature inscriptions and the writings of the foreign travelers. Custom was another significant aspect of ancient legal system, which was approved by almost all the Smritikars. Precisely, we can say Hindu law evolved with the help of sacred and customary laws. Brihaspati approved the need of preserving the usages of each country, caste and family intact in legal matters, otherwise the people may rise in rebellion and disobey their rulers. The ancient work on statecraft recommend that the victorious ruler must show respect for the usages and customs prevailing in the acquired territory. Kotele, he went a step ahead and elaborates that the conqueror should adopt the same mode of life the same dress, the language and customs of those people. He should follow the people in their faith with which they celebrate their national, religious and congregational festivals or amusements. We must appreciate some significant aspects of the ancient legal systems. For example, talking about criminal cases. According to the law, until the guilt was proven, the accused could not be punished. Even in context of civil matters, the trial consisted of four stages. Plant, reply, hearing and decree, which we shall be discussing in detail in one of our classes on administration of justice in ancient India. 
The sources reveal that ancient Indians preferred a bench rather than a single judge. It was the fundamental duty of the judges to do justice without any fear or bias. Talking about Gupta period, we know that Gupta period was considered to be the golden age and is known for producing rich corpus of legal literature which reflects a distinctive advance in the legal system of ancient India. It was during this period that lawgivers drew a clear line of demarcation between civil and criminal law. Ram Sharan Sharma, an eminent historian in his book on aspects of political ideas and institutions in ancient India, has discussed how Brihaspati enumerated 18 duties of law. 14 of these have their origin in property that is Dhan Mool and 4 in injury that is Himsa Mool. The former can be compared to Dharmasthya section of Kautilya and the later to his Kantak Sodhan section that is civil and criminal. Dharmasthya that is the civil courts and the Kantak Sodhan that is the criminal court which again we shall be discussing in detail in our class on administration of justice in ancient India. On account of the growth of private property in land which was sold for money in Gupta times, we find detailed laws about partition, sale, mortgage and lease of land in Gupta law books. All this showed considerable progress of rational trends in judicial procedure. Along with that, there were superstitions that invaded the judicial procedure. Manu prescribed only two types of ordeals, Yajnivalkya and Narad raised the number to 5 and Brahaswati to 9. Now this is not clear if that was done intentionally or to accommodate tribal people with their beliefs in different ordeals. However, the development will strike anybody who cares to glance through the law codes. Many of these ordeals may not have been used because the criminal would broke down in defense and thus held the course of justice. Mode of proof were divided into two classes, human and divine. Human evidence included documents, position and witness. Divine proofs consisted of ordeals which were resorted to only when the ordinary method of proof was not feasible. In case of difference of opinion between the parties to the dispute whether to use human or the divine evidence, Katyayana, he was one of the most rational thinkers I would say, Katyayana recommends the king to accept the human evidence. And it was only in extraordinary circumstances that the divine proof was resorted to. Not only this, we also get to know about the use of circumstantial evidence from Sudraka's Mrich Kattika. It was again resorted to in case of absence of human evidence. H.V. Srinivas Murthy in his book History of India discusses that the Hindu jurist did not give any scope of ambiguity in respect of human proof. They have defined what is a valid document, classified them and brought their utmost utility. You will be amazed to know that they were aware of the spurious documents. They not only criticized this practice but have also prescribed punishments for such offenses. Our jurists have shown justiciable concern for minors and women so that they do not get unduly cheated. The last of the human evidence was witness. Our jurists have given an elaborate list of those who were ineligible and eligible for deposition. After discussing the significant aspects of the ancient legal system, we cannot deny the fact that it is criticized for discriminatory practices that were existing in ancient times. There is a need to analyze it in context of its time. We need to recognize both the strengths and the shortcomings of the ancient legal system. We must acknowledge that despite reflecting discriminatory practices and social inequalities, its contribution in strengthening social norms and order cannot be ignored. That's all for today's lecture. See you in the next class. Have a good day.